the screen to participate. And uh, we do have uh, 12 countries already that raised hand, and maybe we can uh, follow the hand that are raised. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, to the left of my screen, I can see uh, the representative from Guinea. Please go ahead and ask your question. Merci. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. The Republic of Guinea congratulates the Regional Director for the quality of the progress report and affords this opportunity to thank the WHO for the various support Guinea has benefited from through the various outbreaks or epidemic outbreaks in our country. Referring to COVID-19 in Guinea, the situation could be summarized as seven. We have about 28,925 cases and a total number of deaths of 316 people. Government, with regard to the COVAX initiative, has been able to vaccinate more than 500,000 persons who have received the first dose and close to 3 million vaccine doses are expected in the coming weeks, which will make it possible for the country to vaccinate by the end of the year, at least 50% of their targeted population. With regard to the new COVID wave, notably the Delta variant, our health emergency measures are still in force in the country. WHO, supported us in the management of the Ebola virus disease epidemic in the Dijukore region, which, out, which break out on 13 February. And the end of this surveillance has been intensified and good enough, no new case has been registered till date. Good enough, only three cases of Lassa fever were detected in the forest region. So, in view of all the situations, the management of these, for the management of these cases, WHO provided technical and logistical support, which made it possible for the country to manage these epidemics better. Guinea welcomes the efforts made by WHO in the case of the COVAX initiative to increase vaccination coverage. Thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, for that uh, presentation and for keeping to time, um, please pay attention to the time on your screen. Uh, should we take uh, the representative of Madagascar next? Over to you, please. Merci, Madame la Moderatrice. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, honorable ministers. Distinguished delegates, I have the honor to take the floor on behalf of the Minister of Health of Madagascar on this extraordinary session dedicated to COVID-19 response. The efforts deployed by WHO and its member states maintained and guaranteed essential services and access, access to equitable and fair service in order to provide fair access to COVID-19 vaccine. All of these efforts must be supported in the spirit of global equity and solidarity. Africa should receive more vaccines. COVID-19 vaccine should be considered as global public health by the WHO executive board that has reiterated this week. Welcome the Gavi, the COVAX initiatives for their support in that regard. Madagascar has registered two waves of COVID-19 at reaching positivity peaks of 48 and 34%. Currently, we are experiencing a phase of low weak transmission with weaker rates of posit positivity. Madagascar began rolling out vaccination from the month of May, 2021. And 
Population level of acceptance of vaccination is currently high. We're regarding our strategy. It is important to guarantee fair access to COVID-19 treatments and medicine, manage patients properly. Development of medical analysis laboratories constitutes an opportunity to improve detection and surveillance of diseases, not only COVID-19, but also other diseases. Efforts in the fight against COVID-19 should be an opportunity to support African pharmaceutical industries. We thought about, we have set up Pharma Madaga for the production of local medicines, but also we need to support research across the continent in view of further developing traditional medicine. We, uh, in, uh, we intend to better contain COVID-19 through better approaches adapted to our country. An interaction measure was taken in July 2021 in Madagascar in view of the strategic contextualization. And for that, we'd like to thank the WHO country office, but also the regional office for the technical and financial support that they has provided the country since the beginning of our response. We hope that this will be an opportunity to further strengthen our health systems. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much as well for keeping to the time. I see so many hands on my screen, at least 13 of them. We wouldn't be able to take all the um, questions and contributions during this session, uh, but we'll have two more segments. Um, the first one uh, after this uh, on uh, community uh, issues, and then we look at the way forward. Uh, so we will distribute uh, some of your contributions that way. So please bear with us. Uh, so next on my screen, I have the representative uh, for Mali. Uh, please take the floor. Thank you for giving me the floor. Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I would like to congratulate that is on behalf of the government of Mali and on behalf of the Minister of Health, Sangari Daminato, we would like to commend the WHO and also congratulate our sister, Dr. Moiti, who with their entire team, including that of Dr. Richard Moigo, have deployed an excellent work since the beginning of the outbreak, but also during the other epidemics that affected our continent. I will also want to congratulate my brother and friend, Dr. Hendros, the Director General of WHO for the excellent work they has done across the world since the outbreak of this epidemic. I would like to say that I am proud to be among the special envoys of COVID in Africa. I would also want to congratulate my brother, Dr. John Kengelson, the Director General for CDC Africa for the excellent work that they has relentlessly deployed together with all partners, notably WHO, in favor of our continent. For its part, Mali has begun. We registered our first case of COVID-19 in March on March, that was around 25 March 2020. As of today, we have registered a little less than 15,000 cases and a little less than 530 or 36 deaths. Surveillance is ongoing. We began the first phase of vaccination on 31 March 2021. And as of date, we have registered about 86,400 persons with the second day dose. During the second campaign, the second campaign is on the way. We would like to thank Dr. Fauci for what he said, notably that WHO has continued to strive to establish equity and to stop politicizing COVID and vaccination related issues we should understanding as a global concern and we should welcome and we welcome the vaccine 
grants through the COVAX initiative that Mali, Mali has received. In fact, Mali is currently re rolling out more than 150,000 doses of Johnson Johnson. There are some challenges. We are further strengthening national coordination. In fact, like in every case of health emergency, like was the case in 2014 with Ebola outbreak in West Africa, we encountered a major coordination issue, generally speaking. So we'd like to strengthen coordination, strengthen surveillance. And we will also strengthen, well, dear colleagues, dear distinguished delegates, given the, the many people who would like to take the floor, please let us be straight to the points. And therefore, given time constraints, I would like to request our colleague who has the floor now to kindly conclude. Thank you. My last sentence states that we will step up research and on behalf of the higher authorities of Mali, I would like to once again thank WHO. Mali will always do what it can do in favor of its population, for African population and for all people across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that contribution. Uh, we would like to now go to Namibia. Apologies, ma'am. May I just check that the dele delegates can hear you? Please, please go ahead and speak so that we can just confirm that you can hear you. Uh, and we cannot hear you, ma'am. So uh, as we sort out uh, that audio issue, uh, shall we go to South Africa and then we'll, we will come back oh, to you, ma'am? I think I was- We can hear you now. We can uh -huh. hear you now. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I said that uh, for the sake of time, let me observe the protocol as it has been established this morning by the chair. I want to share the experience of Namibia uh, with regard to the response to COVID-19. And uh, of course, our first two cases in Namibia were confirmed on the 13th of March, 2020. And by then, a National Emergency Operations Center was already established due to the ongoing outbreak of hepatitis E since 2017. Now, what were our efforts in effectively responding to COVID-19 pandemic? The country has adopted the incidence management system to coordinate COVID-19 response activities at national as well as subnational levels. We also reactivated a multi-sectoral national disaster risk management committee, including various um, clusters such as uh, RCCE, case management, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to mention that uh, all these various clusters are meeting twice a week to update the Honorable Minister. So we also have strengthened Public Health Emergency Operations Center we recruited 1,860 healthcare workers, as well as administrative staff members on a temporary basis. Provision of additional 1,195 beds in public healthcare facilities, 182 beds in private healthcare facilities, and additional 1,078 beds in non-healthcare facilities especially for COVID-19 response. We increase oxygen capacities through installation of oxygen generating plants in three high volume state hospitals and oxygen concentrators with the support from development partners and business communities. With regard to laboratories, uh, we also capacitated our laboratories. We expanded the COVID-19 testing from four in 2020 to 16 laboratories in 2021. And the establishment of another four laboratories in a selected district is in progress. In addition, to further reduce the turnaround time for laboratory results, the ministry also, with support from partners, rolled out 
antigen rapid diagnostic test resulting in a total of 3,947 tests conducted countrywide by 20th of August. The country experienced three waves of COVID-19 pandemic, and as of 20th of August, the country recorded a cumulative total of 123,483 COVID-19 confirmed cases, translating to 942 cases per 100,000 population. Uh, the, and then... Ma'am, if you just pay attention to the screen, you just run out of time, if you could just uh, okay. wind up. Thank you. Okay, okay. Let me just wind up and say that um, with the, the vaccination, uh, the campaign is going on very well. We have now cumulatively administered 572,000 uh, um, vaccine doses that we have received, and we have now administered close to 203,000, uh, which is now 13.5 percent of the people who have received the first doses, and 96. Uh, 1,559, which is 6.5. So we, we have launched the kick COVID-19 out of Namibia campaign. S'il vous plaît, cher collègue, veuillez conclure, s'il vous plaît. More and more people coming for the campaign. We offer our sincere condolences to families that have lost their loved ones during this time of the pandemic. And may their souls rest in peace. Uh, thank you very much for the floor. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that presentation. We'd like to focus uh, this, in this discussion on the question of the third wave, and then we will come uh, to other issues in other segments. Uh, we would like to go now to South Africa. Please take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Uh, let me firstly just uh, uh, take this chance, uh, opportunity to thank uh, the WHO, both at the Geneva headquarters, uh, um, DG Dr. Tetros and his team, and also our regional director, Dr. Mweti, for their support. As you know, uh, in the continent of Africa, South Africa has been the epicenter of the epidemic. We also experienced our first case in March 2020 on the 5th of March. Since then, um, there's been uh, three waves. We're currently in our third wave. Uh, we have had severe devastation when uh, there was a lockdown uh, in the first wave, um, uh, and uh, which had a, the lockdown to try and, and uh, control the spread of the virus. And once that lockdown was relaxed, we had the, the surge, uh, the peak of the first wave in, in June uh, of, of 2020. We subsequently had our second wave in um, end of November to December, going right up to February, from uh, December 2020 going to February 2021, which was even more severe with higher deaths, especially also sp spreading quicker and also affecting, uh, we have had fatalities even for people under the age of 50, even under the age of 40. We then in early this year started our vaccination campaign with the Johnson and Johnson uh, doses. Um, and now that was with the health, we prioritized the health workers and we have seen the good results. Uh, when the second wave came, um, I mean, that, that was just after the second wave. Now in the third wave, we can see the results of that vaccination of health workers. We have less uh, health workers getting affected by the third wave. This third wave started end of June, uh, uh, towards the end of June this year and in our biggest metropolitan city of Johannesburg, driven by the Delta variant. And more transmissible, more people getting infected, more deaths, again, also younger people. But our, uh, at least our health facilities have been able to cope thus far. Cumulatively in South Africa, we have had just over 2.6 million uh, cases of, of COVID and uh, just under 80,000 deaths uh, as we speak now, 79,500 recoveries, just, just over 2.5 million. So we are currently in the midst of the third wave, as I've mentioned. Uh, we have uh, pushed up our vaccination campaign. As of yesterday, we had administered just over uh, 10.8 million doses, both uh, uh, Pfizer and J&J. &J. 
uh, uh, which has been administered to just over 8 million people. So we, we are aiming to cover at least between 60 and 70 million of our popula adult population of 40 million. So we want to thank all our partners at WHO and also thanks to our president who has been spearheading the acquisition of vaccines for the whole continent and we're also benefiting from that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, there has been a lot to learn from South Africa. Next, we will take Niger and then we will go to the next segment to discuss uh, communities before we come back uh, and open the floor again uh, for more participants. Niger, this is your time. Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm still Dr. Rabul Abbashe, Secretary General and the Minister of Public Health, representing the Minister of Public Health. The Chair, ladies and gentlemen, honorable ministers, distinguished delegates, I would like to request you to kindly play the video which the minister registered, and we will follow that video together. We would like you to play the video, please. I don't know if you heard and understood me. Our minister recorded the video expressing Niger's position with regard to the COVID, it is contained in that video. Kind you, thank you for kindly playing the video. While the team um, identifies that video and apologies, um, we will uh, make sure that it is played uh, during this session. Allow me to just move on the discussion uh, to the question of community. We will come back uh, to that video uh, from Niger. Um, this is an important discussion and indeed we cannot exhaustively talk about all the issues during the limited time that we have today. But let's turn our focus now to a pertinent issue in every response, communities. Without their involvement, nothing works. So how do we build trust in communities to accelerate the COVID-19 vaccine rollout both on the ground where people live and online where more and more of us spend a considerable amount of time. To discuss this challenge, we're joined by Dr. Henry Mwebesa, Director General at the Ministry of Health of Uganda on behalf of the Honorable Minister for Health. Also joining us is Kojo Boakye, Director of Africa Public Policy at Facebook. Welcome. Thank you ever so much. Fantastic. Thank so you very much. We are thrilled to have you um, online uh, tonight, and it's you know just a fitting way to discuss uh, this issue and the role of uh, social media, an increasingly important role that it plays in our lives. So first to Dr. Mwebesa, Uganda is now in the process of conducting mass vaccination for COVID-19. What challenges are you seeing with respect to trust? The, you know, so many speakers today has, have talked about trust from the communities. What challenges are you seeing uh, with regard to trust and how are you addressing them? Thank you very much, Anne, Honorable Ministers, the Regional Director, all distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, apologies from the Minister, Honorable Jen. She has been assigned another important assignment and was not able to be with us. Uh, just as a quick background, Uganda is just recovering from a second COVID-19 wave, which started towards the end of May 2021 and ran through mid of this month. During this wave, we noticed an increasing number of cases, more severe cases and more deaths and I think it was associated with the Delta virus. The total cumulative positive cases to date run around 118,000 out of 1 1.5 million tests done. We have so far recorded 2,960 deaths and recovery is just below 100,000. Getting straight to your question, Anne, Uganda is in the process of conducting mass vaccination, but we have quite a number of challenges related to vaccine uptake. 
and you also ask how we are addressing those challenges. With respect to the vaccine uptake, we have so far received 1.7 million doses of the vaccine, mainly AstraZeneca, through the COVAX facility, and uh, 300 doses of Sinovac from, as a donation from the People's Republic of China. To date, we have managed to vaccinate about 1.2 million 970 southern people with the first and the second dose of the vaccine. That is by the last two days. And only 30% of those have received the second dose. And the government has a pipeline of different vaccines uh, for acquiring the vaccine, mainly through the COVAX facility and through the AU, AU. And our target population is 22 million. That's mainly the population above 18 years of age as our major population to be vaccinated if we are to achieve herd immunity. And we rolled out our vaccine, the vaccination on 10th March. But and since then we have met a lot of challenges with respect to trust. And I can assure you, the, our first consignment of vaccines was about 900,000 doses, but it took us about three months to absorb even a third of those vaccines. For the first three months, we were still around 300,000 absorption to the extent that we were even getting scared that we were going to have those vaccines expire unutilized. What was the biggest challenge? The main challenge was vaccine hesitance, even among our health workers themselves. You can, which created a lot of suspicion, fear, and anxiety. You can imagine when your own health workers who have even been given priority to be vaccinated first as frontline health workers, and they are refusing to take the vaccines. Because among the target of the health workers, for the first three months, we were only able to vaccinate about 30% uh, or slightly below. And the majority of them had not been vaccinated, including physicians, doctors, and some senior paramedicals. So people would say, if your own health workers cannot be vaccinated, why do you want us to get vaccinated? How do we trust that kind of vaccine? There was a lot of fear of side effects, given that the vaccine was new and recently developed and had to go through a quick, short period of approval. People had concerns. One of the big, other big challenge, people had concerns about the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines. And people were reading, people were reading a lot of information about these vaccines, especially in the urban areas. The, another big challenge, there were very many rumors, misinformation, and deceit the vaccine in the media, in the social media, and from people of all walks of life. Now, to make it worse, there was this global mass media reports, even Anne from BBC itself. You are here in the middle of the vaccination, and you have a big article, News 18, on the BBC that such and such a country in Europe has suspended AstraZeneca. And you are here vaccinating people with AstraZeneca. And you have got these vaccines from those big countries. So they are saying they are giving us these vaccines, but for them, they have suspended the vaccine in their own countries. And you are here, you are a director general, you are a minister of health, and you have to explain why you are vaccinating people with AstraZeneca well, the countries where it is coming from have suspended it. And it is really a hard task to explain. And we also had social media misuse, especially from the young youth and a few educated people. People could create stories and send them out widely. Most of them really not true information, but misinformation. Somebody creates a story and sends inf information everywhere. In this country, uh, People have phones, there's a lot of, uh, people have uh, social media, media and they can access that information very easily. For instance, one of the common one was, if you take the vaccine, you are not going to drink alcohol for 45 days. And you can imagine what that has to do with the men who drink their beer very much. You can't drink for 45 days. There was also another common one that those who take the vaccine will lose their potence, will become impotent. You can imagine also, and those were just created, and others, younger girls, you will not deliver once you take that vaccine. So it causes Indeed. that kind of excitement and fear. And Indeed, there were many, workers, many examples. Yes, 
you have to go through a lot in order to explain those. Yes. And then, um, if I could just bring in um, Mr. Buaki to respond, because you've talked a lot about uh, social media and uh, misinformation and disinformation that has been shared on um, social media. And uh, we have Mr. Buaki from Facebook here today. Um, you know, with regard to this uh, misinformation uh, about vaccines that is spread on social media platforms, including Facebook, how are you countering that and promoting access to accurate health information? So, so first of all, thank you so much for the questions and thank you to WHO for inviting Facebook to participate in this session. I've learned a lot personally by listening to the various ministers and experts. And I'll use this opportunity to say all protocols observed because I know we've been pressed for time. Um, I, I think actually speaking next to Mr. Wabasa is really interesting because at the moment, Uganda is the only country within the sub-Saharan African region in which, in which Facebook is, is essentially not available to most Ugandans openly unless they're using a virtual private network. But the, the problem he describes is one that we recognize and you know, mindful that social media plays a role, but mindful as Mr. Webessa spoke about that other forms of media play a role in this. I think as a social media company, what we understood was that actually we could lean into one of our key strengths, which was the number of people using our platforms globally for a, to access information on a globe, uh, about a global pandemic. And if you think about 3.5 billion people using various Facebook platforms, it presents an incredible opportunity to present them with authoritative information. And we felt, you know, how could we do that? So one of the things that many uh, of our honorable ministers across the continent, especially in places like South Africa and Nigeria would have seen is the use of messaging through uh, WhatsApp bots, for example, which enable uh, Africans across the continent to ask questions, to dispel the kind of misinformation about potency or an inability to, to have alcohol or an inability to uh, be able to conceive or give birth once you've had the vaccine or indeed caught COVID. And I think that's been incredibly successful for us. There are examples further afield from places like Indonesia in which the, the health authority established one of these bots and the challenge that Mr. Wabessa mentioned about health workers being themselves reluctant to take the vaccine, for example, was tackled by that bot. And within a week of launching that bot, more than 500,000 uh, health workers, 500,000 of 1.3 million health workers from Indonesia have accessed authoritative information about the vaccine and gone on to obviously make decisions about the vaccine. In places like South Africa, where we established with our partners a WhatsApp bot with the Ministry of Health, we were able to guide at that time under 25s towards authoritative information about the vaccine and give them the ability to register. And in the first week of that chatbot being established with the uh, Department of Health in South Africa and our partners, Preco, 142,000 under 35s, which, is, which is, has been a hesitant group in some countries, were able to register for the vaccine. And as, as I talk now, 800,000 people have registered through that WhatsApp bot. So I think it's messaging has been key to us to giving them access to authoritative information. And that's not just about the vaccine. I think I've been proud of our work as a company from early 2020. One of the things that many people who use Facebook would have noticed is the COVID information centers. So if you went to Facebook and you looked at the top of your Facebook, you would have seen access to the COVID information center. And that would have guided you immediately to the Ministry of Health, if it was accessible in Uganda, but certainly across the continent or WHO information, which would give you information about how to put your mask on, uh, how to avoid COVID, how to uh, wash your hands, to what extent is the um, virus spreading? All of that was again, key to it. I think I could also add a couple of things if you quickly permit me. The development of survey information, which has been used by not only the WHO, have been great partners in helping us work with that, but academic institutions and governments across the continent. We have one of the largest, if not the largest ever survey, uh, health survey in the world, conducted with our partners, Carnegie Mellon and the University of Maryland, 
in which some 70 million people have volunteered to provide information about their experience, not only with COVID, but also the vaccine in more than 200 countries, including many in SSA, giving us a, a, a wealth of information about everything from vaccine hesitancy to wearing masks to et cetera. So I think Facebook, again, being able to use its scale, being able to understand the importance of partnerships with organizations like WHO, Carnegie Mellon, the University of Maryland, and many African um, uh, academics has been able to use that survey data to inform not only the second, uh, the first, second and third wave that we're fighting against, but also in our view, future health risks that come as well. And this data will be incredibly important for that. I expect amongst the 350 delegates here that some of them will come from national uh, blood donation associations as well. And Facebook, again, has been able to lean into that work. We heard in May uh, last year about the, the lack of blood within the Senegalese blood donation service and, and the, the, fall, the, the, the falling amounts of blood due to things like lockdown and people being hesitant to go to hospitals within in places like Egypt and Namibia and Zambia. And we thought, how can our platform be used to encourage people to still give blood at a time when countries desperately need it? And we launched the blood donation service now available in some 16 countries. I myself personally have worked in places like Zimbabwe and Namibia and South Africa to launch those services. And we have millions of people using them. In Egypt, a million people have registered for that service. In South Africa, 1.5 million people ensuring that, 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 that blood is available. That's and really again, fascinating to just learn about the tools at your disposal and the areas of collaboration with ministries of health, with governments, mm. uh, even with other organizations, uh, and mm. how you can bring together all that information, because you know exactly who is coming to, the, to Facebook, you know their demographics, and it's really fascinating to learn about how technology can support um, the, the interventions. Um, we, we hopefully will come back to you uh, Boke and uh, Dr. Mwebesa. But at this juncture, let me um, now let us bring up the video from Niger, as we had promised. And I understand there are also videos from two other countries, Comoros and Zambia, uh, that will play. And then we will come back to this discussion. Could we please play the video from Niger, please? Uh, shall I bring in um, Angola at this point as we just uh, sort that out? Uh, Angola, you have your hand up, the representative from Angola, and then we will come back to the videos. We are talking about trust mm -hmm. and communities. How do you deal with that? Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Regional Director for Africa, Dr. Moeti. Ladies and gentlemen, ministers of health and heads of delegations. Regional Director. It is a pleasure and an honor for me to, to uh, speak on behalf of the Ministry of Health at the special event on COVID-19. Our country has not been very much affected by the COVID-19. However, the effects that have, there have been negative effects and we are taking corrective measures accordingly. Uh, we have uh, tried to support households that are affected. And even so, we have been able to collaborate with national uh, laboratories. And we have been able to carry out genomic sequencing. Um, we have 52 uh, GeneX uh, machines, and we have deployed them across the country. Until yesterday, had 37 
thousand registered case and 180 uh, deaths, a uh, case fatality rate of 2.4 percent, and a 22 percent recovery rate. 1.8 million doses of vaccine have been administered for the first for the first dose and 70,000 for the second dose. It seems that the second wave has been more severe for us than the first one. So we do hope that 90% uh, of our doses which will be available to us will be able to deploy it. And we are counting on the support of our leaders. Here in Angola, we actually have good acceptance of the vaccination rollout process. Of course, there has been confusion as to the uh, side effects, the negative side effects of AstraZeneca. However, we continue to pursue our vaccination rollout. In terms of implementing the vaccine uh, rollout of COVID-19 in, uh, in Angola, we do have a platform which is coordinating our rollout and we are having good results in this, in this regard. We have also been counting on the support of the military to help us in our campaign. It is important for us to continue to have access to vaccinations and to make sure that we can ensure that we can really have a continuity of the vaccination. Uh, please, can we uh, proceed to uh, the next speaker? Because I really think it's important for us to it's important for us to move forward because it seems that there has been some problem in hearing the speaker. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, shall, we move, shall we move to Ethiopia as we sort out the issues with the, the audio from uh, the representative from Angola? And we are talking about communities and trust, how we would like to learn how you have dealt with that in Ethiopia. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, and uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, the Honorable Excellencies. Uh, thank you for this great session. As we all know, this COVID-19 pandemic has been ravaging the world for more than a year now, claiming uh, many lives, more than 4.4 million, which really demands a coordinated and concerted efforts and solidarity from everyone. And when we say oh, everyone, it does require a whole of government approach, but also really uh, supported by a whole of society approach, engaging on communities. And especially uh, currently, we, have, we are seeing the spread of this new variant across the, the globe, uh, along with increased social mobility, vaccine inequity, and inconsistent application of public health measures, which is causing a dramatic increase in cases and deaths in many countries. With this especially highly contagious uh, Delta variant now found in more than 110 countries. And when we look at the vaccine that is administered globally, even though 32.4% of the world population have received one dose so far, only 1.4% 1, 1 of people in low income countries managed to get at least one dose of uh, vaccine. And uh, this is, I think, we believe, is one of the causes that is causing this rise of uh, the third wave in the pandemic as of uh, this past few months. As our country's response since March 13, 2019, when we detected the first uh, case of COVID-19, we have implemented the COVID-19 response preparedness and response strategy, expanding, I mean, establishing and expanding uh, lab uh, testing, treatment, isolation centers, and screening at point of interest, but also uh, the critical pillar was really beefing up the risk communication and community engagement to, dis to reduce disease transmission at community level. And for this, we have been engaging uh, strongly the media, including uh, different artists, but also using our community health extension program for house-to-house -house surveillance that really engage the community in terms of 
teaching, not just teaching the awareness, but also uh, to ensure that there is a change of practice in terms of the non-pharmaceutical interventions. And currently for the vaccine, uh, with the support of international partners like the COVAX, Gavi, WHO, and different donor countries, we have rolled out vaccination uh, since March 13, 2021, uh, giving priority to most vulnerable groups and so far vaccinated 2.3 million uh, people and planning to vaccinate uh, at least up to 20% in the uh, end of 2021. And still vaccine hesitancy is an issue that we are working on uh, both with uh, different uh, communities and uh, using our uh, risk communication system. And But still the challenge is that there's really limited access to vaccines where we really want to call upon uh, leaders in the developed world, developed world to seriously act in ensuring uh, this uh, access to less developed nations as uh, we really need to join hands in uh, beating this deadly pandemic. So the, we are definitely engaging communities in terms of addressing the hesitancy issues in vaccines while also uh, mitigating the, fa the fatigue that is there in adhering to non-pharmaceutical interventions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for keeping to time, the Honorable Minister from um, Ethiopia. Um, I would just like to go back uh, to our panelists, uh, Dr. Mwebesa and Boake from Facebook. Dr. Mwebesa is uh, from Uganda. Uh, and just, uh, just to wind up this discussion about trust and communities, there's so much debate about how much people uh, who have hesitations about vaccines can be convinced to change their minds. What do you see as possible? What strategies have you seen work well? First to you, Dr. Mwebesa, what has worked well for Uganda? Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much. And uh, what has worked up very well for Uganda is first of all, we engage the top leadership of the country to convince the country, to convince everybody, the president and the first lady, had to take the COVID vaccine in public before the cameras and convinced everybody. Then we identified also community leaders and influencers, especially the top political community leaders, especially the religious leaders and the kings, the community leaders, the cultural leaders, and also took the vaccine in public and they convinced the people. And we see that one also has worked very well. We have worked very well with the mass media First of all, talking to the managers of the big uh, radios, big television stations, convinced them, gave them all the information. And then they have also been talking about the vaccination. Then we do regular press briefings uh, at the Uganda Media Center and share information about the vaccines, allay the fears, the anxieties, and the concern. We address the issues of rumors and misinformation and address all the social media uh, problems. We have got a dedicated team which responds uh, to the mass media and uh, dispels most of those rumors. Uh, in one incident, actually, we had to open up our hospital. We took, carried all the press and took them to our big national referral hospital. And they looked at the patient, of course, with the previous of the patients. They saw what was happening in the ICU, which was full. They saw what was happening in the high dependency unit, which was full. And then they saw down ambulances lined up, waiting to offload patients, but there were no beds. Majority of them ran out from there and went and took their vaccines that day. So, and then they started convincing other people to take their vaccine. So we also think that that is very important to mobilize the press and have them talk to, to the people. And we think it can work very well. Uh, we have to get also involving regular sensitization of the media as I have already talked about, especially about to the adverse events of the vaccine and also how we are rolling it out in stages, in schools, among teachers and everybody. And we even talk about the breakthrough, uh, breakthrough epidemic diseases. So in, in a nutshell, you have to strengthen our advocacy using very uh, influential opinion leaders. We have to use political leaders, cultural leaders, and penetrate the community. Uh, we work with the village health community, resource persons, and they 
go move village to village, house to house, and educating the people and encouraging them to take the vaccine. The role of the community resource persons, we found it very, very strong in supporting us uh, to change the people's attitude. And more recently, when we got the second wave, which was more serious, more deaths, and more severe. Because the first wave, most of the cases were actually asymptomatic. In the second wave, we have got more serious cases, especially from the Delta uh, variant. This has pushed very many people to come for vaccination. Actually, at this time, there's more demand for vaccination than the vaccines that we have. People come and rain for the vaccines, but you find we have shortage. So now the bigger challenge we have is how to get more vaccines for our people. Indeed, thank, thank you. you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Mwebesa uh, from Uganda. And I, I believe you, you see that as a better challenge to have, you know, when you have people yeah, that, that's certainly to better. take vaccines. Because that can be vaccine. solved easily. Indeed. Indeed. Let's now bring in uh, Boake from Facebook once again. You had talked about so many things that uh, Facebook is doing uh, to enhance collaboration, uh, to, to, to make sure even to provide uh, data uh, for surveys. Um, what else do you see as possible? Where do we go from here? Because we have a huge population and you did talk about the under 35s who had been reached and who then went mm. for vaccinations. Mm. What more uh, can, can governments that many of which are represented here, can, what more can they do uh, to work with you to reach those people who are very active on social media? So to work with us, I think this, hopefully my participation here is further evidence, as well as the many examples that I mentioned before, our work in 54 countries across the region with the information centers. We are open to working with governments across the region. We have done, I think we're on, it's been well documented that we, we've used more than $120 million of ad credits. Many of those, much of that coming to the Africa region. I think we're working with 27 governments across the region to ensure that the kind of information that Mr. Morgwessa and other colleagues across the continent are trying to convey to their populace gets there in the most efficient ways using Facebook platforms, and that works. It would be remiss of me if I didn't say that access to Facebook is an extremely important part of the pushback. Access to social media, where so many people get their information, is really, really important. So I, I would first of all say that we're ready and willing. We have teams who work with government departments on, on how to uh, maximize or optimize their use of social media to get that information out there. And, and as I've said before, how to use data to provide evidence-based interventions um, on how to do it. So I'd encourage that. Um, I guess added to that is, is the onus is on authoritative information, as I've mentioned. The onus is on using data, as I've mentioned. Interestingly, I can tell the minister from Ghana, my learned friend, that in the central region of Ghana, 66.8% of people are ready to have the vaccine or say they are. And when you get to Accra, it's 68% as of last week. So that's how granular we can get and how much evidence we can provide to decision making. So that's important. But I also think it would be remiss of me if I didn't mention that it was important for companies like mine, so social media companies, to remove or at least to inform people about what is misinformation. And I think Facebook, we, there's, there's work to do, but we are leaning in and are proud of our achievements here. I think since the start of the pandemic, we've removed 20 million pieces of misinfo that we know will cause harm, will stop people media using warnings and, the, and articles that push back or bits of evidence that push back. What is actually the truth and what is not? So again, will men have to stop drinking? We can debunk that particular rumor. Will it cause men or indeed women to, to have fertility issues? we can debunk that particular rumor. And we've been able to. Um, I should also add as well, again, speaking to partnership, that, in, that we're so thankful to the health experts from across the region, including those at WHO, the CD, uh, Africa CDC, Nigeria CDC, et cetera, who have been so instrumental in enabling us to expand our misinformation policies. So misinformation we've related to, to vaccines, we've been, I think, more effective than ever before in removing, but certainly misinformation with regard to COVID, we've been really effective in removing or informing people that this is misinformation. I think many people who use Facebook, one of the things that they may not have noticed over the uh, last few years or last year 
is the, is, is the downgrading of misinformation. So there's misinformation that we remove immediately that's not helpful. There's misinformation that we provide warnings on and debunk to help people understand that actually this is misinformation. But at the same time, there's the misinformation which we basically downgrade. So people don't see, or it's very, very difficult to see that misinformation. I think that's been really, really critical. And that's Thank something you. that Facebook can do with the support of health experts and people on the continent. And we're happy to continue doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Boake Kojo and uh, Dr. Henry Mabesa um, for that really informative uh, discussion. I had promised that we would play the video from Niger and then followed by the video from Comoros and uh, Zambia. And then hopefully, um, I've been assured this time that it will work. Uh, and then we can come back uh, to the discussion uh, we had heard uh, from Angola, but the audio wasn't very good. So hopefully we can come back to that. So over to the team to play the videos from Niger. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Président, Mr. Chairman, Madam, Regional Director for WHO Africa, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Delegates, Dear Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, permit me first of all to congratulate the Chairman as well as the other members of the Bureau of this Regional Committee for their brilliant uh, lecture, and we assure them of our entire collaboration in discharging their lofty duties. I would like to extend my recognition to the Regional Director for WHO in Africa, Madame Moite, for her positive impetus to the work of the organization in favor of our countries, particularly with regard to the outstanding collaboration with my country, Niger. I would like to bring to your attention that the theme for the, the general debate chosen by Niger is fight against COVID in all its aspects, notably coordination, surveillance, response, communication, vaccination, logistics, management, individual management and collective management. Our country has been able to acquire more than 1.6 million doses of vaccine with the three types of vaccines available, notably Sinopharm, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. Immunization and vaccination started on 29 March 2021, and it is being carried out throughout the country. As of date, more than 400,000 persons have received the first vaccine that is a coverage of four percent i would like to afford this opportunity not only to commend international and african solidarity through the covax make and avax mechanisms of the african union but also to extend the gratitude of the nigerian people to all partners particularly who africa which has always supported efforts to promote health. At the date of 18 August 2021, a total of 5,660 cases of COVID-19 were notified with 176 deaths, 1,672 persons recovered, which is a recovery rate of 95%. To conclude, I would like to extend the, to you the, the encouragement of His Excellency Mr. Bazoum Ahmed, President of the Republic of Niger head of state i would like to assure you of the determination of the government of niger to work together with all member states and our partners notably the who to achieve more health progress in response to the covid covid 19 pandemic the government of our government of for, the government of Como affords this opportunity to Comment the WHO General or Director of Af WHO Director for Africa, 
WHO have been able to support the state's efforts in, acquis in acquisition of vaccines. And for that, we, are, we appreciate that. We have been able to contain this pandemic, though the, vac the virus continues to circulate and many, many countries are registering high levels of deaths. I would like to extend, I would like to think about the patients in their hospital, but I extend prayers to all those who have been overcome by this terrible disease. I would attest to my compassion to all their families who have lost their lost ones, Mr. Chair, Minister, Fellow Ministers, WHO, Regional Director, WHO Director, despite our weak health systems, or more under the personal leadership and commitment of His Excellency, Alias Bizami, and together with the support of our multilateral and bilateral partners, private society, and the diaspora, we have been able to face this pandemic. At the end of December 2020, like in many countries, the Union of Comoros was affected by the second wave. New variants of COVID-19 were confirmed through sequencing. Once again, the support of the different technical and financial partners was very precious to our country. Mr. Chairman, honorable ministers, the WHO Regional Director for Africa, Como introduced, Comoros introduced vaccine against COVID-19, and it was a milestone in our response. We continued to, we started vaccinating as soon as we acquired the first dose. However, uh, my country is facing the threat of a third wave, and some countries uh, are even considering to resort again to confinements with the consequent economic impacts. The consequences or the lessons in the management of this crisis have showed off many lessons, notably weak coordination, the insular nature of our archipelago further compounds this pro problem. That is why we call for further strengthening of our technical capacities for screening, more hospital beds and sequences of cases, and advocate for more epidemiological surveillance mechanisms at entry points and at air and sea control points. Further financial resources will be used for deploying community strategies through the participation of the community platform in view of better ownership of responses by the communities. Mr. Chairman, Madam Regional Director of WHO, Honorable Ministers, the Union of Comoros would like to draw the attention of our organization and of all member states and all our partners on the fact that it is critical to strengthen our health surveillance systems, notably of primary health care, community participation, and place them at the center of efforts in improving the health and well-being of all. In the context of 2020, 2030 vision of our country, driven by the head of state, Mr. Azian, our country adopted in 2020 an interim 2020-2024 development plan whose priority in the health sector is to promote a health system that is efficient in view of more performant capital or human resources. The, se the seek of solutions, the search of solutions and more resources to ensure continuity of services is highly desired. I would like to plead that I am WHO continue to grant particular attention to countries with weak health systems, like is the cases of the Comoros. Thank you. by Secretariat from the office, as well as the regional office and headquarters. As a member state, Zambia has aligned its COVID-19 response to the strategic pillars outlined in the World Health Organization's guidance documents and the regular updates as given by the International Health Regulations Emergence Committee. Additionally, the country has benefited from the much-needed technical, financial, and material support from World Health Organization and other partners. Zambia recorded its first COVID-19 case on 18th March 2020. Since then, the trajectory of the disease has been dynamic and complex, with a fast-changing impact on its population. The country has experienced three waves of escalated number of COVID-19 cases, increased hospitalization, and a high number of deaths. 
the third wave which began in mid-May 2021 has been the worst that the country has experienced so far and has been characterized by a rapid increase in the number of cases, very severe presentation of disease, leading to many patients requiring oxygen therapy as much as 72%, as well as a high number of deaths. As at 18th August 2021, there were 203,169 cumulative number of cases with a case fatality rate of 1.8%. Cumulatively, testing in Zambia has been around 116,092 per million population. The third wave had reached its peak sometime around the end of June this year when the positivity rate was as high as 26%. Currently, the number of new cases being reported has reduced steadily with an average positivity rate standing at 6%. The pandemic created an unprecedented demand on the health services and disrupted the social economic activities in our country. Zambia has also detected and reported a number of the different strains of SARS-CoV-2 the virus which causes COVID-19, including the Delta variant, which has been associated with easy transmissibility, leading to severe cases, hospitalizations, and death. Chairperson, Zambia has also been implementing the COVID-19 vaccine program as part of the response strategy to mitigate the effects of the pandemic. And as at 18th August 2021, 2.7% of the eligible population had been fully vaccinated, while 3.7% had received their first dose awaiting full vaccination. This clearly highlights the inequitable access to vaccines in our region, considering that more than 4.5 billion vaccine doses have been administered worldwide. Nevertheless, Zambia is grateful for the support that has been provided so far through the COVAX facility the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Trust, through which the Zambian government has already committed to get 4.4 million doses of Johnson & Johnson. Furthermore, the country is applying several non-pharmaceutical public health measures to minimize the risk of disease transmission among its people. Chairperson, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted areas that are needed to be strengthened in our healthcare systems. There is need for more investment in infrastructure development, human capital, medical supplies, and commodity security, as well as research and development, particularly in local manufacturing capacity and technology transfer. Regional collaboration and support will be cardinal in these areas for us to ensure universal health coverage is attained for all our people. Chairperson, I thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those messages uh, from Niger, uh, Comoros, and Zambia. Now, um, let's turn to the third and final topic of the day, the future of emergency preparedness and response in Africa. Uh, numerous recommendations have been made for restructuring pa pandemic preparedness at the global level. I understand there are more than 200 of them to date. There is the pandemic convention, the IPPPR report, recommendations from G7 and G20. So what's in it for Africa and how do they shape African Union's relations? To take a look at where we go from here, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Zidi Zahav, the, Hon the Honorable Minister for Health from Mauritania, and Dr. John Nkengasong, the Director, Africa uh, CDC. Welcome, distinguished gentlemen. First of all, to the Honorable Minister from Mauritania. Uh, Mauritania has been working to strengthen its capabilities to prevent and address health emergencies. Can you share with us uh, Mauritania's experience to date? May I check that the Honorable Minister from Mauritania uh, can hear us. Uh, let's bring in Dr. Nkenga Song, as I can see him. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. 
خلي خلي Honorable Minister, the floor is yours. Bonjour, Monsieur, et merci beaucoup. Bonjour. Est-ce que je me fais entendre? Good day. Can you hear me? Yes, please continue, sir. Thank you, therefore, for giving me the floor. Honorable ministers, Madam Regional Director, dear participants, I greet you. With regard to the question about Mauritania's experience in rolling out COVID-19 vaccines, and I believe that was the question, if I heard you well. Mauritania developed a vaccine rollout plan that targets 63% of the population, that is 2,600,000 people above 18 years of age. So Mauritania immediately adhered to the COVAX initiative and also to the AVAD initiative of the African Union, but also Mauritania's diplomacy mobilized to other brother and friendly countries. So far, Mauritania has been able to acquire a number of vaccines reaching about 800,000 doses which has made it possible as we speak to vaccinate about 500,000 persons who have received the first dose. But also with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, coverage in terms of people who have received the full dose has reached 11%, that is, following the last vaccination campaign that was organized in the country. Our strategy therefore consists in rolling out relatively significant quantities of Sinopharm vaccine with a longer duration. You know that these vaccines will expire in 2022. So we are deploying this vaccine in routine strategy in our health facilities in a continuing procedure. Other vaccines, be them AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson, are administered following campaigns. Every time we receive new consignments of vaccines, this was the case during the first consignment of AstraZeneca vaccines, which helped to vaccinate 150 persons who received the first dose. We recently received a second consignment of AstraZeneca vaccines, which will help these persons receive their second dose. The last or the second to last consignment of Johnson and Johnson vaccine, like I said earlier, it is this consignment that helped us boost vaccination coverage, reaching 10% of the population. We received a new consignment of 100,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson. These will be deployed notably in rural areas. The single dose vaccines are more appropriate for rural settings because it would reduce vaccination costs since it does not require a second vaccination campaign round. So currently, Mauritania is looking forward to organize next week a new vaccination campaign that will make it possible to 
reach out to persons who received the first dose of AstraZeneca uh, to take the second dose and to reach out to targets in rural areas using the vaccine, the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And all this will be done while continuing routine vaccination using Sinopharm vaccine. Uh, Thank this you very much. Is a snapshot of Mauritania's strategy with regard to rolling out of the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your experience, Honorable Minister. And now, as we turn to Dr. John Kengasong, uh, Africa CDC, just like the WHO, has been at the forefront uh, dealing with this pandemic. Uh, you facilitate and promote sustained partnerships um, across you know, different organizations, agencies, governments, and collaboration to ensure effective public health emergency preparedness and response. Just looking into the future and learning from the COVID-19 response to date, what practical changes do you envision need to be instituted to strengthen uh, the emergency preparedness and response uh, on the continent? Dr. Nkengasong. Well, th thank you, Anne, for the, um, the, the invitation. And let me extend this to uh, uh, appreciation to the regional director, Dr. Moeti, for inviting uh, Africa CDC and me to be part of this conversation. Uh, it is a very, uh, it's fair to say that we are dealing on, in Africa with an unprecedented pandemic, which is at, uh, very, very unpredictable and, and uncertain, the path, the trajectory. I would also like to say that uh, we are dealing with a situation where uh, we should expect that it will get tougher before it gets easier. Uh, to, to manage this um, uh, situation. Let me also uh, say that we have to be very mindful of the fact that in the next four to five months, it will be two years since we are living with this pandemic. So uh, we should be uh, conscious of the fact that uh, we are not longer at the acute phase of this pandemic, but we are right <clears throat> in, into the middle of a crisis here, which means we have to begin to think of how we manage the COVID-19 as a program going forward. And recognizing that, um, that yes, it is a topic that we should all be addressing issues of vaccines, but that vaccines and vaccinations alone will not get us out of this uh, situation, especially given where we are with this uh, pandemic. And also given how, um, uh, what we now know about the limitations of access to vaccines on, on the continent with less than 2% of our population vaccinated. I say this because the notion of uh, that we had earlier uh, in the pandemic that we vaccinate at least 60% of our population and some countries put it at 70% to achieve herd immunity uh, is, is fast uh, getting obsolete. We may never get to herd immunity given what we now know about this virus and that um, vaccines, uh, unlike other vaccines, do not prevent uh, uh, infection, uh, they prevent deaths. I mean, that messaging has to be very, very clear because it means that we have to have a package of things that we're rolling out uh, going forward. So uh, I just wanted to start there because it's very important for us as we project forward and how we deal with subsequent uh, and new other pandemics or outbreaks uh, to first of all know that we have an issue in our hands now, which is, uh, to get rid of this uh, this pandemic. And I think what we should be uh, doing is a combination approach of both vaccines, public health measures, and, and treatment, treatment meaning management of, of the COVID cases. Going forward, we've learned uh, very clearly that uh, there are at least uh, four key areas that, uh, that we need to, to strengthen. Uh, first of all, is that as a continent, we need to beef up our ability to manufacture what I call health security commodities, i.e. vaccines, uh, therapeutics, diagnostics, and uh, uh, commod uh, commodities like personal protective equipment. It is very unfortunate that until COVID hit us and treated us the way it did last year, there was no country in Africa that was producing diagnostics. Now you have um, countries like Morocco, Senegal, and others beginning to produce diagnostics. We have to be, I'm very encouraged that several countries now are we're gearing up to produce vaccines because uh, it has to be very clear in our mind that we'll be vaccinating for many years to come. I mean, that is just um, the, the reality. So I'm very encouraged to see uh, countries like South Africa, 
Senegal, Rwanda, uh, uh, and others, Egypt, Morocco begin to step up there. Workforce is a serious uh, limitation for ability to, uh, to challenge. Everybody talks about innovation technology, but technology are deployed by people. And we lack, uh, to, we need to focus very uh, deliberately on what kind of workforce do we need uh, for the 21st century. We need to be also bold and courageous enough to say that we need an elite public health uh, uh, response workforce, uh, which uh, will position us in a, a place to better respond to a subsequent outcomes. And of course, uh, our own uh, institutions, public health institutions. And lastly, financing. We need a new architecture of financing. I understand that there's a report out there from uh, put out by the G20 talking about a global disease uh, threat fund, but I say that is welcome, but it should be looked at in the lens of how do we regionalize those uh, respond uh, uh, funds. I mean, I mean, I will be the last person to argue that you need another global fund-like structure for, for the world. I think uh, the continent would need to have its own respond fund that can be, uh, actually demonstrate ownership and leadership there. So I think going forward, and um, those are the kind of reflections that I have for where we are with this pandemic, the challenges that we face and what we must do to get rid of it, and then uh, what we need to uh, prepare ourselves for the future. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Nkenga Song, uh, for those uh, brief but very important remarks. Um, over the next um, half hour or less, uh, I would like to give a chance to uh, the countries that have their hands raised. I can see nine of them on my screen. Uh, I had promised to go back to Angola because we had poor audio earlier. And I would like to really request that we uh, keep the uh, comments very brief so that we can give everyone a chance. So let's go to Angola now. Thank you very much. Regional Director for Africa, Dr. Moweti, distinguished ministers. It is a great pleasure for me, Regional Director, to speak on behalf of the Ministry of Health of Angola, and we would like to commend this important event. Angola, in the global context, has not chances uh, that problems are still persisting regarding the sound, and so perhaps we can proceed to a new uh, speaker. This is what the chair is saying. Uh, my, my apologies, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we'll now we can hear you. I can actually speak in French if if you would like, you know, I can stop speaking in Portuguese. And what about the English speaker, says the chair? You know, if there are problems with the interpretation from Portuguese, I can speak in French. Well, I don't know whether our English speaking delegates will understand me or is, I'm not quite sure what the issue is. My apologies for that. Um, once again, allow us to move on to um, Congo uh, with a representative from Congo uh, ready to present. Oui. Ça va. Merci. Nous prenons la parole au nom We are taking the floor on behalf of the Minister of Health, Dr. Gilbert Mekoki. The first case of COVID-19 in our country was detected on the 14th of March 2020. And since then, we have had more than 800,000 thousand uh, confirmed cases and we have had 190 uh, 39 deaths the response plan, plan plan that we have in place to combat covid 19 
is uh, probably is now under underway, as is our national vaccine deployment plan. And uh, this is all being spearheaded by our head of state. The response we have is a decentralized one. Uh, we are working at the district level and to date, after launching the, uh, the campaign, we have 180,000 doses of uh, vaccines that were administered. That is the first uh, dose. And then we had another number of people who also received the second dose. I'm sorry, the sound is a bit poor. We have been trying to take note of the AEFIs, uh, and we have had a few serious cases of um, adverse events following immunization. The main challenge we face is ensuring continuity of the supply of the vaccines. And of course, this also has financial implications. And what is very important for us is to get the uh, acceptance of the population to uh, taking the vaccine. That is why it has been important for us to stress the issue of communication. The third challenge that we have is that we need some support from WHO. Uh, we would like to thank WHO for their help on the ground. And we really, truly thank you for that. Thank you very much um, for that presentation from Congo. And now we move um, to the neighbor, the, Republic Democra the Democratic Republic of Congo. Please take the floor. Mr. Chairman, your excellencies, distinguished uh, ministers, dear college regional director of WHO for Africa, all protocol observed. The Republic, the DRC, is uh, facing this, these health crises uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as other health emergencies. This pandemic is a really uh, disturbing and affecting our health uh, services. And we are trying to do our best to work on health, strengthening our health systems in order to cope with this pandemic. This is why the DRC is, is uh, trying to uh, target the most vulnerable uh, populations to, uh, to have um, their vaccines administered to them. Now, we have been having the support of the authorities at the very highest level. We have a committee which is uh, chaired by the uh, Prime, and Prime Minister. Um, we have been working on strengthening epidemiological surveillance and to make sure that we can have early diagnosis of, diagnosis of cases. We have also been working on strengthening case management at the centralized and decentralized man manner. This is very important for us to safeguard the health of our populations. DRC is part of the, has a subscribe to the COVAX um, facility. And this is how we received some doses of AstraZeneca in March. This uh, vaccination campaign has, is underway, but uh, we had to strengthen our communication strategy to improve uh, community ac acceptance. The first phase took place in July this year. We were giving a first dose of the vaccine to uh, 80,000 uh, people, and uh, then we will have another phase for, for the second dose and a second round. We can note that Africa is the most prejudiced uh, region in the world in terms of receiving uh, COVID-19 vaccinations. It's very important for us to have access to COVID-19 vaccine as well as, as ther therapeutics and diagnosis tools so that we can have a sustainable combating of this disease. 
it's very important for us to focus not only on the uh, the the, med the medicine that we need, but it is important to look at other commodities that we need, and they need to be deployed countrywide. We also need to strengthen our surveillance uh, systems, particularly in border border areas. And, and we need to focus on carrying out rapid diagnostic tests. Finally, with regard to the situation on the ground, we have really seen that this is a very serious uh, the health e emergency. And therefore, uh, we think it is very important for us to cooperate our neighbors and to really overcome the challenges that have facing us particularly to safeguard our population. I'd also like to take this opportunity. I think it is an opportunity for us to strengthen our health systems. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, my apologies for uh, that hiccup uh, in the technology and thank you to the uh, uh, Republic of Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo for that presentation. I see that uh, the representative from Nigeria is ready uh, with uh, his presentation. Apologies for the issues that we've had repeatedly with the audio from Angola. I have been informed by the team that, uh, sir, if you could submit that statement to the Secretariat and they will share it with the participants um, so that your message is heard uh, clearly. Thank you very much. Over to Nigeria. Thank you very much. Rito, uh, I want to first of all congratulate the Chair of the Occasion, the Minister of Togo, on his appointment, <coughs> on his election, and also commend the Regional Director and DG of uh, WHO for their tireless advocacy on behalf of Africa, uh, without which I wonder if we will be where we are now, even with vaccines. I shall be sharing our experience in Nigeria. Our motto is to work hard for the best and prepare for the worst, which is what we have been doing. We have strengthened our health system with oxygen. We have 125 uh, treatment sites and about 38 ICUs. Uh, their occupancy at the moment is just about 8%. We are the threshold of the third wave, but we are coping very well so far. We are not in distress. Now, I also believe that we do not know all we need to know about the COVID-19 and where it is going to take us. It's still an unfolding issue. And I believe that we must very closely monitor what's going on in other countries, Europe, in India, in Asia, to learn lessons and uh, see what lessons can get us, uh, how far the lessons can get us. We also need to, uh, as much as possible, engage in research to uh, add to the body of knowledge. And if COVID will be with us for a long time, we might as well be finding ways to live with it in the long run or the long haul, which includes being able to produce vaccines. Now, uh, Nigeria uses a whole of government approach, uh, bringing in ministries of interior, aviation, and humanitarian affairs to address issues that arise from uh, those sectors. Now, with regard to disinformation and misinformation, we have strong teams that work on that, but we must also not forget to address the demand side. We must be able to give vaccinations to those who want vaccines. We have already administered 4 million doses, uh, about two thirds of them uh, to those who have received two doses and one third who are waiting for a second dose of AstraZeneca. We are also going to get uh, the Johnson & Johnson, which we are restricting for security compromised areas, for romantic populations, and for those who live in hard to reach areas, mountains, river areas, where you need to go there only once, and it is too expensive to go beyond that. With communication, we are working hard with all our traditional leaders, religious leaders, community leaders, to increase uptake. But we are seeing also a fatigue that even populations are no more and necessarily following what their leaders tell them, and there's a declining compliance with these methods. Therefore, vaccination will remain the strongest thing that we are going to uh, we build on, and Nigeria will support the uh, production of vaccine in Africa, and is going to bid because of our population 
to uh, join the nations that produce vaccine on this continent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks. Um, we are really running short of time, but I really want to give all the countries that have their hands raised uh, a chance. So let's go to Botswana and then uh, Cape Verde, uh, Senegal, uh, and then uh, uh, Kenya. Thank you. Botswana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Let me thank all presenters and everyone for the insightful remarks and sharing of valuable lessons. Chair, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought unprecedented socioeconomic challenges on our societies and placed a significant burden on our health system. As highlighted by the Regional Emergency Director in his presentation, several countries in Africa, including Botswana, are experiencing a steep increase in the daily infection rates. The number of patients needing hospitalized care exceeds the health system capacity, which unfortunately is leading to loss of lives. We express our appreciation to the WHO Regional and the Country Office, Africa CDC, and our partners for the unequal uh, support to manage this crisis, including through training and capacity building, diagnostics capacities, and vaccine deployment. We also congratulate the WHO and Africa CDC collaboration on the launch of the COVID-19 network of genome sequencing laboratories, which aims to expand genetic surveillance capacities across the continent. In this way, my ministry has rapidly improved the capacity to test and monitor variants of concern and manage outbreaks. Botswana has acquired its vaccines mainly through four platforms. These are COVAX facility, AVAT facility, bilaterals, and direct procurement for manufacturers. Our COVID-19 vaccination campaign is grounded in strengthening the already existing primary health care structures through the expanded program of immunization and promoting inclusion and universal access of the target group. Cognizant to the constraint supply, the campaign is modeled using the prioritization tools as provided by WHO, adopting a risk-based approach and identifying age as a critical determinant for severity of disease and mortality. The goal of our vaccine plan is to strengthen the healthcare system through reduction of mobility and mortality due to COVID-19 and ensure the protection of healthcare workers. Chair, in order to end the pandemic, we need rapid deployment of COVID-19 vaccines in communities. We are deeply concerned about the inequitable access to COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics. In the Africa region remains largely behind in the vaccination, which is leading to preventable loss of lives and livelihoods. We therefore call on the WHO to continue to work with manufacturers and key stakeholders in order to increase supply of vaccines to the region. It is also important for the WHO to continue to support countries and ensure that the gains achieved in the health sector are not lost. Amongst other things, in responding to the pandemic with agility, we have increased regional isolation and hospitalization capacity with an increased oxygen supply. Efforts have been done to shift the COVID-19 response from hospital care delivery to the community through strengthening the home-based care approach. The private sector has also pledged to share the burden of case management and vaccination program. I wish to acknowledge the collaboration and support of different development partners, including civil society organizations and private entities. Healthcare professionals and other frontline workers have played a pivotal role in the response efforts. In conclusion, Chair Botswana remains committed to working with WHO, member states, as well as the partners to share the best practices and experiences to enable us to reach our vaccination target and protect lives and begin economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Botswana. Over to Cape Verde. If you can hear me. Shall we go to Senegal and then come back to Cape Verde? Je suis très honorée en tant que I'm very honored to be addressing this August Assembly and to be speaking on behalf of the Minister of Health of Senegal. Regional Director of WHO, distinguished ministers, Mr. Chairman, dear delegates. The delegation of Senegal would like to thank and commend the WHO for the presentation of the report uh, and also for organizing this special event on COVID-19. Our country is really facing huge challenges because of COVID-19. It has really affected all our health services um, and the whole system. We therefore have increased workloads 
workload and we are trying to consolidate our activities in terms of combating combating uh, COVID-19 because really it is something that is affecting all our member states. Africa is really facing a great challenge here which is a shadow hanging over us but we need to try and do our best especially in combating the Delta variant variant because really it's affecting our country and all our countries together. The region has shown that our governments need to invest more in health, particularly in preparedness and response to health uh, security, health issues and pandemics. And therefore we need to uh, improve our surveillance systems. Senegal says that we really need to strengthen our technical expertise. We need to set up better infra infrastructures we need to have a recruitment drive of uh, specialists, and we also need to have social uh, system to make sure that we have a continuity of our health services. We would also like to commend the COVID facility in helping us with vaccinations. We are quite con uh, convinced that we have had co encouraging results for our region thanks to this uh, COVID facility and they are helping us to roll out the vaccines. We have uh, administered doses to more than a billion people in, in Senegal. We, uh, Senegal is working actively with its uh, partners in order to roll out the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, and we are working with the Institut Pasteur in our country. I would like to thank the WHO for their support and, help, and ask them to continue to help us to accelerate our activities. We really need to build more resilient health systems. And to this end, we have set up some mechanisms and, com and uh, commissions, and we have also invested more money in this important area in order to make sure that we have a more resilient health system capable of dealing with this pandemic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, shall we now move on to uh, Kenya, if Cape Verde is still not ready? May I see the video, please? Thank you, Kenya. Please continue. Thank you, Chairperson, Regional Director for mm -hmm. WHO. Honorable Ministers, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the Kenyan delegation would like to thank the Secretariat for organizing this very, very special event. Its objective is to discuss the current COVID-19 pandemic in our region. And the meeting provides a perfect opportunity for member states to share best practices as well as challenges that will help all of us respond better to the ongoing pandemic. Kenya, like others, reported her first case of COVID-19 on 13 March 2020, and since then the country has experienced three waves of the pandemic. We are currently responding to the fourth wave, and as of 23rd of March 2021, Kenya has reported 229,628 confirmed cases, including 213,000 173 recoveries, representing a recovery of about 93%, and about 4,528 4, 4, deaths with a case fatality of about 2%. Chairperson, distinguished delegates, in response to the pandemic, Kenya has put in place the following measures. One, the response efforts are coordinated through a whole government and multi-agency approach in accordance with the executive order number two of 2020 issued by his actions the president on the 28th of February, 2020. And two, the Public Health Emergency Operations Center is fully activated and coordinates technical response to the pandemic. Further, the ministry consistently reports the status of COVID-19 pandemic to WHO in line with the International Health Regulations 2005. Three, the diagnostic capacity in the country has been scaled up from an initial two laboratories to about 70 laboratories currently spread across the country. And antigen testing is also being undertaken at points of entry and settings where rapid diagnostic testing services are required. And four, Kenya is conducting genomic sequencing with the alpha, beta, and delta variants detected so far. We are also providing support to other countries in this initiative, including South Sudan, Burundi, Seychelles, and the Comoros. Five, the Kenya Ministry of Health launched the national COVID-19 vaccination on the 5th of March after receiving doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine through the COVID-19 Global Access Initiative, COVAX, 
and the prevention is ongoing with very good uptake of the vaccines. We are also conducting mandatory screening of travelers at all points of entry to minimize risk of importation of the additional variants to the country. The government, of course, has implemented multiple strategies to limit the person-to-person -person transmission of COVID-19 in the country, including postponement of large gatherings and events, and also enforcing mandatory use of face masks in public places as an additional measure to curb the spread of the virus. Chairperson, as we respond to this pandemic, we continue to learn lessons that will prepare us to face future public health events. We have, for instance, learned that preparedness is very key, minimizing the negative impacts of epidemics and pandemics among our populations. In conclusion, I wish to point out that the urgent need Thank for WHO yes. and other group of institutions to assist developing countries access adequate doses of COVID-19 vaccines for their populations and establishing local vaccine production capacity to meet demand by promoting technology transfer and reducing intellectual property barriers as key in ensuring the sustainability of vaccine availability in the region. I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Cape Vard, I can see your video is up now. Please take the floor. Distinguished Ministers, Regional Director of WHO for Africa, distinguished guests and participants, it is a great honor for me as the National Director of Health to make our contribution to this important issue. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought a lot of challenges for us, not only in terms of organizing and managing our health systems, but it has also shown up some shortcomings. But on the other hand, it is also an opportunity for us to improve our health systems and our preparedness and response to such health emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic. And so it's important for us to improve in terms of managing cases at national level, to control the number of cases, to, to have control of the situation, particularly at border areas, and to come up with appropriate responses. We have uh, more than 34,000 uh, cases of uh, COVID that were identified since March uh, last year, when we identified the first case. We have 97.5% of uh, people who were recovered. And we also 700 uh, also people who are currently being isolated uh, because of having the infection. And um, we are at the lockdown, the, the emergency level number one. we have a case a positive rate of just 3.7% according to our last uh, uh, countdown. In regard to the epidemiological situation, we are trying to be very cautious and take the right kind of measures. 63% of the population have already taken the first dose and uh, some others have also taken the second uh, second uh, dose. And we do think that if we are able to continue with our vaccine rollout, we will be able to control the ep epidemiological situation. And we will also be able to ensure that uh, conditions are in place uh, so that we can take preventive measures and control uh, the situation. We therefore need to strengthen once again our health systems and also to improve the access to vaccines. This needs to be carried out in an equitable manner across the population and across our countries. And because it's important, especially in terms of controlling the variants of concern. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, at this juncture, uh, we only have five minutes left and that uh, would go to the musical intervention that was to come at the end uh, of this session but may i take direction from the chair please because we still have two countries that haven't 
uh, made their statements, uh, but had indicated their intention to do so. That's the Gambia and Equatorial Guinea. And uh, there's also um, uh, the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. May I take direction from the chair if uh, we can uh, extend by a few more minutes to allow uh, these um, uh, countries and uh, organization to present. Chair. Oui, merci, madame. Si je comprends bien, schématiquement, on a peu... If I have understood correctly, there are four more countries that should be speaking, and then we have five observers as well. And then we have a musical interlude and also a wrap-up. If I'm looking at this program, I think this would take us half an hour. In addition to that, we have the very last part of our session for today, where a number of people should be taking the, sh the, sh the floor. And this is also on our agenda for today. So if we add all of this, I think that we need to reach an agreement as to extending this meeting for a further hour. It is now uh, 1600 hours GFT, and it means that we will be finishing at 1700 hours. If we're all in agreement, that's the way we can proceed beginning with the four countries who still need to take the floor. And each country will be having three minutes. The observers will only have one minute. The music will take five minutes. The wrap up will be five minutes. That is about 30 minutes or so. And then we add on to that. The last speakers, the ex Her Excellency Grata Pandal Wandanega, Mr. Kone Mafi Kiyuku, and Keba Bonye. So, if we are all in agreement, we will still be together for another hour. Okay. Can we proceed uh, in, this, in this way? Small intervention from Namibia. I have another engagement at six. Can I be? Way. Yes. I have another engagement at six. Can I be excused? And I see everyone tomorrow morning. Bon, d'accord. Est-ce que vous avez un impératif? Fine. If you have a commitment, there is no other alternative. Now, I would like to know whether the ma majority agree with my suggestion from before. If so, we can go ahead. And I will ask the moderator to begin by giving the floor to the four other countries and then the five uh, observers, uh, then the music and the wrap up. Okay. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Pour the... Thank you very much for your flexibility. As we can see no objections uh, from the delegates and the ministers. Thank you very much for the, and um, thank you for your good management of this meeting. I can ask Anne to proceed with the, with the continuation of our discuss, discussions. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the interest that you have shown and for your availability. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Dr. Moeti and the chair uh, for being very gracious and to all the participants. May I now invite the Gambia to make their presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, for giving me the opportunity uh, to say a few words. Uh, well, this is uh, 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 probably uh, the third or fourth or fifth time uh, we are getting together uh, to discuss uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that had actually uh, been unprecedented. And uh, we all know uh, the challenges we've had in the health systems in our various countries. Uh, most of us had very weak health systems before the, uh, uh, the arrival of this pandemic. And uh, I think uh, it's an opportunity also to use the resources of, uh, we are all getting from the pandemic uh, response uh, to build strong health systems. 
Uh, certainly, the resources are far from being enough, but I think they should be used uh, properly well uh, to strengthen the, the system. Uh, however, I think uh, we've had an opportunity to learn from what happens elsewhere. Uh, fortunately, uh, the various waves started elsewhere, uh, the first, the second, and the third, uh, before getting to Africa. Uh, and uh, certainly, with our unique challenges, uh, we've been getting experiences in the various waves, uh, you know, a little later on. So uh, we don't pray for a fourth wave, but we should be prepared. You know, that means uh, the gaps that are there currently need to be filled in. Uh, so my, one of my suggestions is going to be uh, for some of our countries, especially the ones with uh, uh, low capacity, uh, to get support from the WHO, to build capacity, to identify the gaps. Uh, when it comes to uh, surveillance mechanisms, when it comes to uh, strengthening uh, the intensive care, you know, some people have resources, but actually the technical support uh, to have a functional uh, multi-bed intensive care unit, uh, it takes uh, quite a lot of experience for countries to be able to do that uh, within a record period. Uh, we've all had our challenges. The third wave has uh, proven to be uh, more deadly uh, high, high rate of infection, young people being affected, which is similar across uh, uh, the various countries. Uh, but we should get prepared and uh, so that uh, we are not caught on our uh, the next time. With regards to misinformation, it's a big problem. And I think uh, the RCCE should continue. It's a continuous process. It is not that we've dealt with it and that is it. Because uh, people who misinform, unfortunately, tend to be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, that some of us who send the good messages there. Uh, everything we put out there, they want to counteract. Uh, politics has entered a lot of uh, COVID responses. Uh, you know, the vaccines had had a lot of bad publicity before they even were manufactured. So we need to uh, step up our game and make sure that uh, we intensify uh, the recruitment of the people. The last time what we did when we received vaccines at the airport, we took the chief imam, uh, well, the head of the Supreme Islamic Council and the president of the Christians Council. Uh, you know, thereafter, we saw a surge in the number of people coming for vaccination. I know, uh, you know, time thank is you. limited. I will stop here. But thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for being giving those brief remarks. And now over to Equatorial Guinea. Equatorial Guinea, uh, may I see your video? Thank you very much. Over to you. Good afternoon, Brigid and Abdi. In the Republic of Equatorial Guinea, a total of 104,591 PCR tests have been conducted, of which 9,000 were positive. COVID-19, with incident positive rate of 4.9 percent, total of 8,798 have recovered, amounting to 97.7 percent, and have recorded 123 deaths, with a lethality rate of 1.37 below the world lethality rate indicator of 2.1 percent. We have also progressed with another important tool of control the national vaccine campaign against COVID-19. Up to date, about 325,449 doses have been administered, of which 187,836 people have received their first dose, representing 21.90% of target population, and 137,612 have received their second dose which represent 16.4% of the target population. We are using the Sinopharm vaccine and we have bought 800,000 doses in stock. The important strategies that our government has taken in the management of this pandemic consisted of political commitment, financial commitment, and internal coordination. We have got two management committees, the technical committee and the political committee, which is presided by the vice president. Given the shortage of specialists in the management of COVID-19 patients and other serious diseases, the government had, had to improve the skill of health personnel, doctors and nurses, 
through training and negotiating the hiring of 77 case specialists from the Cuban government. The availability of COVID-19 detection case personal protection material and essential equipment uh, is a priority that for the government of Equatorial Guinea and has been managed effectively at the international level, making use of the national company Saber Intercontinental Fleet for the transportation of all purchase materials in, from the international market. To ensure the collection of COVID-19 diagnostic samples in all hospitals and in the community, two PCR laboratories were installed in the two main regions of the country to sample collection materials, transportation units, and trained personnel. With the support of WHO, an efficient epidemiological data management system at the national level was developed to optimize the collection, processing, analysis of COVID-19 data, as well as its dissemination in the national and international level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sticking to time and uh, that uh, very important uh, presentation. And finally, um, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to go back once more uh, to Angola. We really want to hear your presentation and the team here informs me that you can have this chance and let's hope that things work out this time. All the best and over to you. Thank you very much. I would like to apologize for any inconveniences. Regional WHO Director, Director, it is an honor for me to speak on behalf of, of the Minister of Health of, of Angola. The Minister of Health of Angola. I would like to say that Angola, and we have now, uh, we, the sound was lost, but uh, the, the, in the context uh, of the COVID-19 due the, to the adverse effects, and we took certain measures to ensure control. Okay. The measures aimed. These consequences include the decline in family household revenues. We, however, were able to set up hospital and more hospital beds in provinces, and we have provided more intensive training. We have set up seven molecular laboratories. And we received from the African Union assistance that was provided in all provinces in the country. Already we have vaccinated more than a thousand doses. More than 700 persons have received the two doses already. Currently, we are experiencing the second wave of COVID-19 with greater impact compared to the first wave. And the positive rate currently in Angola is 5.2%. Angola has already vaccinated 90% of most exposed populations. To implement COVID-19 vaccination, we have set up a digital platform to ensure that we provide the necessary assistance to all persons in need. Generally speaking, we advocate that we should have more equitable access to vaccines and this would make it possible to achieve greater vaccination coverage of more than 70% of the population. In that regard, we would need to guarantee that all mechanisms put in place to ensure access to vaccines in our vaccine should be effective. It is only, particularly in the African, only in this manner would the African continent be able to achieve response targets in the face of COVID. Thank you for your attention. And once again, we, are, we apologize for the issues that arose due to sound challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for sticking to the time. And I'm really glad that it finally worked out and we, we, we 